Uh, welcome to tonight's Community Preservation Committee meeting. Uh, One Government Center, Fall River, Mass. City Council hearing room, Wednesday, September 22nd, 2021, 6 p.m. Pursuant to the open meeting laws, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recording or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Um, can I start with roll call? We'll start. Uh, Alexander Silva, present. Caroline Aubin, present. Kristen Cantara Oliveira, present. Paul Machado, present. John Brandt, present. Victor Farias, present. We're missing John Ferreira, and uh, we're missing the mayor appointee and uh, housing appointee, which will be joining us at next meeting. They uh, made two appointments to the board, so we'll have a full board. Um, let's see. Um, Sandy, do we have any citizen input? No. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion for approval of the minutes for July 20th? 2021. I make a motion to approve the minutes for uh, July 20th, 2021. I'll second. Uh, roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliveira, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Farris, yes. Uh, minutes pass. Uh, then we have uh, approval for minutes for August 24th, 2021. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of August 24th, 2021. Second that. Okay. Roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliveri, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Ferris, yes. Okay, motion passes. Now we're going to open up the eligibility hearings. Uh, tonight we've had your packages in front of us, so we've pretty much read through them. So just give us some of your highlights not you don't have to go into depth or go to a 15 20 minute press uh, presentation uh, we might have some questions for you uh, so we're going to start out with uh, father Kelly's uh, park poles and lights for 400,000 uh, that's a uh, Jack Hackett uh, Fall River scholarship softball field uh, is anybody here for that one would you like to come up I have my wife come over because I'm a little hard on the hearing. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Could I just get her name for the minutes? Natalie Petroni Hackett. Would you like to tell us a little? I mean, obviously, you're putting up lights for the ballpark. Um, uh, does any of the board members have any questions on this one? No, this time, I don't. Okay. Now you're getting uh, Joe uh, to help you from uh, Maplewood Park with your presentation. Joe Shantz, did he give you any information? Yes, I did. Uh, we did meet with Joe, our committee, okay. and he did. Okay, he put an excellent us, presentation. Give us some valuable there, so. information. Yeah, he put an excellent presentation. So if you follow him, um, okay, this will go under uh, recreation. Do I have a motion to <coughs> pass? Eligibility. I'll make a motion that it's eligible for funding under um, open space recreation. Okay. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliveri, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Farias, yes. All righty. Well, good luck. Um, I do have some yeah. questions. Um, when we see the funding application, I think what would be helpful is some specific information about uh, how many people use the field. So I know that when we did the Maplewood Park, we had the number of teams, the number of kids, right. the age ranges for them. So I think that would be very helpful yes. information. I will have that information for you. Terrific. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to appear in front of you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is the Westport Extension Quickershan River Rail Trail for 120. Uh, we have Bill Kenny on that one. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we start, could I just take the opportunity to introduce everybody to our new assistant planner, 
Uh, Caitlin Young, who is with me tonight, doing? for the first time in decades, the planning department has a, <laughs> an assistant, and uh, it's a big deal, and we're happy to have her here, and I, I know she'll be meeting each of you in your various capacities in the groups and organizations that you represent, so we're very excited to have her here. So what can I tell you about the, do you want me to talk to you about this? I can tell you very quickly, uh, your uh, committee funded a, uh, uh, the, the hiring of a consultant to prepare the final construction documents for the last uh, several feet of the uh, Alfred J. Lee McCrinquishan River Rail Trail from where it ends now behind LePage's restaurant roughly to the town line, Westport Fall River town line. Um, so that process is ongoing now. The construction documents will be delivered to us in uh, late winter, early spring, um, and they'll be ready to go out to bid at that point. So uh, we, we'd like to think that since you did the, made the first part of this possible, you'd like yeah. to finish the job and actually put a shovel in the ground and uh, get it done. So this Good. falls under your category, I think, pretty clearly, open space, recreation, enhancements yeah. to property that you already own. We already own the right of way there. That's right. not an issue. And it's only, what, 500 square Well, I was told originally 500. It's a little bit less than that. Oh, but, okay. Uh, so to finish it, right to Westport. Yep. And the folks in Westport, uh, uh, I get uh, some information about that. Uh, eventually, I think there'll be some uh, serious work to extend, extend this trail deeper into Westport. <clears throat> And uh, uh, from time to time, there's a group of folks that are actively involved in that, and they think they're getting reactivated now that they see what we're doing, and uh, they say, well, what, what Fall River's doing, bring it right to the town line, let's keep going. So. Yeah. Does the board members have any questions? I just, I just have one. So what exactly are they doing? Are they just extending the walkway and then, the, like, the vegetation and that yep. around it? Yeah. It'll look uh, pretty much like what's there already, just, just more of the same, just to get it to the town line. Good. All right, can I have a motion to uh, uh, list this as eligible for funding under uh, open space recreation? Uh, it's just not for recreation. Mm. recreation. Just have recreation. Just recreation. Open space yeah. is acquisition. Yeah, uh, I mean recreation. I'll make a motion that it's uh, this project is eligible for funding under the pro uh, outdoor recreation. Yeah, to immigration. Thank you. I was trying oh. to think the word subject. I'll okay. Roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Alban, yes. Kristen Cantera Oliveri, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Excuse Excuse me. Me. yes. All right. You can stay right there, Bill. You're up. Uh, the Tupper Park uh, is next. 140,000 on Jefferson Street. Yeah, this is a little more interesting project in a sense um, actually originated under uh, Sam Sutter's uh, term um, and Councillor Linda Pereira had uh, brought to the to the mayor's attention this triangular piece of land that's directly northerly of the um, DCR boat launching ramp and fishing area at the end of Jefferson Street and this is a, an orphaned piece of land that was just sort of left behind when Route 24 was put in. You find pieces of land like this everywhere. And uh, they just sort of left there, and nobody knows what to do with them. And the thought was that uh, the city should get title to this parcel because there's so little public access to South Wattupper Pond, and this would be a nice addition to that. And so I was charged with the task of getting uh, MassDOT to declare this parcel as surplus property, which they did. And I'm, I'm sorry to say they did that about four years ago. And <laughs> we've been waiting since then for the uh, title to be transferred to the city. Uh, Matt Thomas is actively working on this. Uh, the attorney at MassDOT, um, her attention has been redirected to this project after a long hiatus. And we have every expectation that the title will be transferred to the city within the next two months. So. Um, you may not own it today, but you will by the time you make a funding decision. And uh, what the uh, ask for is um, the, the price is a dollar. They're giving us the land. So that's not an issue. Uh, what we're hoping to fund is a study uh, to design the park itself, the facilities that will be there. We're going to need a little parking area. We're going to need maybe a picnic area, uh, some launching facilities for kayaks and, and small boats. Um, 
and uh, maybe a, a platform for fishing, things of that nature, to do it upright and uh, have it nicely landscaped to make a nice addition to public access to the pond. Um, and so that's our project. I understand uh, recently that the folks in the rowing center may have their eyes on this piece of property as well. So uh, I don't know what that future will bring, but for now, this is my project. This is what we'd like you to look at. And maybe there'll be some talk between us and the rowing folks uh, later on. They may have some interest in using a piece of this. So we'll see. Okay. Any questions from the board members? Yes. Um, because it's the acquisition of open space, the CPA statute requires a permanent deed restriction. Yes. Yeah. Is that included in the 140,000? The, the deed restriction, uh, you mean the, the drafting of the restriction and yes. so forth? I'll do that for free. Are you worried uh, about the legal cost of making the, writing it up? Yeah, that's, that's just sort of something the planning department will do. And okay. for you folks to review and approve, of course. You know. Okay, because that's required by the statute, sure. yeah. but... It's got to be permanently reserved as open space yes. recreation land, absolutely. Yes. Yep. And there are a number of them that have already been uh, obtained by the water department in the bio reserve. Uh, I can't speak for the water department. Yeah. No, I wouldn't, I I wouldn't dare speak for the water department. But they're not, obtain, they're not using the funds to obtain this land. They're using the funds yeah, for we're not, study. We, we, you're going to own it. This is to do the study and to develop the park. Yeah, they're not yeah, buying we, the land with the money it's for a study. We'll have um, title by the time. I, I think to be in compliance with the statute, we need to have a permanent deed restriction whenever there's acquisition of property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you wish. So, just, <laughs> you'll make just the rule. Opinion. You'll make the rule so. when the time comes. All righty. Anyone else? So, can we have a motion to make this eligible under open space and recreation? I'll make a motion that we have uh, on the open uh, space and recreation for uh, what type of park. Right. Can I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantera, Oliveri, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Vic Petharis, yes. Okay. Next, we have, uh, oh, you can stay right there. Uh, Cook Pond Trail Phase 1 survey, uh, $3,850 on locations uh, 1089 Dwelly Street. This is an interesting situation. As you may know, for quite a few years, there's been talk about creating a multi-use path around Cook Pond, which would be a great addition to the city's open space and recreational properties. Um, the, um, the most recent pass at this uh, uh, was in connection with the King Philip Mill, and there was hope and expectation that if that property were to be developed, that before the city disposed of it, they would reserve a walk, you know, an easement for a path like that. Unfortunately, the political climate at the time uh, didn't allow for that to happen. Um, and uh, nothing much was done for a couple of years until out of the clear blue sky, we got a call from the folks who are in charge of the, of the uh, Dwelly Street Armory, the National Guard folks, and they told us that um, they, were a pro they were under a mandate to upgrade their facility over the next X number of years. I think they <clears throat> have in mind a five-year program to update that facility, and they knew about our interest in a walking path, bike path, multi-use path. And they said, we, we don't want to move forward with our definitive plans before we touch base with the city to see if the city is still interested in doing something like that because we've got some frontage on the pond. And actually their frontage would be like the, the very beginning of the path uh, that would be created. And um, they said, look, they, they pretty much gave us the cookbook on how to acquire uh, rights to this property and um, told us that the um, first thing we have to do is get a survey because they want to know what we really want, what we really need to make this happen, and then they'll hopefully adjust their uh, plans accordingly to make sure that they don't uh, in, you know, impinge on that, on that section. Um, so we have the cookbook. The first step is to get the, the survey done. Uh, we've got a few quotes. It looks like it's a modest amount, but uh, we can't go any place with this until we get that done. And uh, once we have that, uh, there's a very good chance that the, the um, uh, 
uh, State Armory Commission gets involved and they'll say, yes, go ahead and uh, give the city easement rights uh, to use this uh, perpetually. Um, and the good news is this is not, e even if the rest of the path never gets built, this is an, a nice uh, entry uh, onto the uh, uh, waterfront there for folks to enjoy. Um, the good news is, uh, and you, some of you are probably familiar with this, as you go around the pond, there are a lot of uh, pieces that are in public ownership that are going to be pretty easy. Well, not easy. Nothing, nothing's easy, but relatively easy to deal with to get this done. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some pieces in private ownership. And if you have a good plan and you want to exercise some eminent domain takings, as you did with the bike path, the, the, the original bike path, that can be done. So this is a, a long-range project. Uh, well, they say the longest journey begins with a single footstep. This is the first footstep, and uh, we're hoping that you can help us uh, move in that direction. There would be public access from Dwelly Street? Yes. Any other questions from the board? I do have a question. Uh, so, uh, do you have a sense of the National Guard's timeline for the base modifications or upgrades? Like, what time yeah. frame the city is working with? They, they told us, that? as far as their upgrades, but they're working on maybe a five-year plan. But as far as getting this done for us, they wanted us to, to appear in front of the State Armory Commission, I think, in mid-October. Mm -hmm. And as well, you know, not quite yet. We've got to get the survey done. and, and, and But it, they can move very quickly on this, as far as our interest in it. But, then we really don't care how long it takes them to do the rest of their work, as so long as they reserve this piece for the city. And just one more question. And yeah. since it's a mildly modest sum to get the survey started, is, was there any consideration to uh, fund this via the planning department itself to kind of get the ball rolling and not wait for the benchmarks <coughs> of the CPC? As you may know, the planning department has no budget. We have, you know, we spent what we had to get Caitlin. You know. We, we have no budget for that sort of okay. thing. We never have. And I just want to make sure. it's, it's unfortunate. But uh, write, your, write your representatives in the council and tell them that the next budget that comes along, they should give the planning department lots of money. <laughs> so the, the survey, then the, uh, they're going to do the construction, the pathway? City will build it. This is just to isolate the section that we want so the guard knows in their planning not to create a structure on that path that would interfere with it. Okay. Um, any other questions from the board? No. Okay. Can I have a motion to move this on to eligibility to uh, recreation? <clears throat> I'll make a motion that this project is eligible for funding under the uh, recreation heading. Uh, would it fall under open space too? Is there any acquisition that falls under this just a survey? No, it's a survey. survey. I'll make a second. Okay. Uh, roll call. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliver, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Rick Patarius, yes. All righty. Okay, next is uh, uh, the bell towers and relocation restoration uh, for $58,859. Uh, Bill Kenny's going to uh, applicant, and that's on South Main Street. Can you tell us a little about this? I'd be happy to. Yeah. You actually took a look at this last time around. Also, let us know where you want to uh, move the water fountain to, because that's a store too. So. I was hoping to my, well, we have a couple of spots in mind. Mm -hmm. um, as you may recall, I don't know if all of you were on the committee last time around. Um, this tower has had a, uh, an interesting history. Uh, it began at a place called South Main Place, which is now where the courthouse is. And um, that was demolished, and, and they moved it to Old Second Street, and there were complaints from residents in the area about the, the noise. They didn't like the bells. And so the ILGWU uh, arranged for the city to locate the tower uh, on their property on 3rd Street, directly opposite the 3rd Street entrance to the city hall. And it was there for a while, and there's a control mechanism in the basement of that building that uh, is used to activate the bells, which is obsolete and no longer functioning. Um, when I presented this petition last time around, the, the funds were mainly for uh, restoration of the bells themselves and getting a new state-of-the-art control mechanism uh, so that we could actually hear the bells. Um, the, um, it turned out, uh, somewhat to our surprise, that the little corner where this tower is located 
It was not publicly owned. Uh, I had been told otherwise in, prep in preparing the petition. It turned out Tony Cordero's uh, LLC owns it. So uh, having discovered that, we brought that to your attention and said, Tony has told us that uh, he may never need that land and he'd be happy to let the city leave the bells there uh, unless he needs it, in which case he would give us a year to relocate them. And I think you felt that that was sort of too contingent at the time, that uh, it, it was something you didn't feel was maybe, maybe it was half-baked, maybe it wasn't baked enough. But the, the good news is that we have identified a publicly owned spot where we can move the bells, and you probably, I hope you're familiar with it, the uh, Cosgrove Fountain site, which is at the corner of Central Street and South Main. Um, the um, uh, DPW director, uh, John Perry, and I have gone out and done some measurements, and the tower will fit perfectly in that spot. Uh, the fountain um, could be relocated to uh, a number of different spots, and, and we just, we're not ready to really make a recommendation as to where, worst case scenario, it could go into storage for a while, but there are, it's a nice fountain, it should be displayed, it should, it should flow, it's, it's, it's really interesting if you've gone up close and looked at it, the, the way that the water falls through the, the fountain into various little pockets, and uh, there are a, a couple of spots where we can move that to. Um, so the, uh, the hope is that, uh, now that we have a public spot that we, we know we can move the, the tower to, uh, that you'll help us do that and bring the bells back to life. The good thing about that corner is there's nobody living in, in that vicinity. There'll be no complaints from neighbors about uh, the ringing of the bells. Do you know about the Cosgrove Fountain, by the way? Or the Cogswell, Cogswell Fountain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting history. Uh, That's a project that should get done too because there should be a lantern on top of that. There should be what? A lantern. There should be a lantern yeah, back the on lantern's top of that. Yeah, the lantern's not there, and, yeah. and, and, but the, the fountain, it should, water it should, should flow, it and should it's a flow. fountain. It it absolutely the whole should. idea was to encourage people to drink water, not booze. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe Jerry Lawton's park would be a good uh, <laughs> be a fitting nice spot, spot for it. No, that's a spot for benches. Oh, boy. <laughs> we're, not, we're not even talking about <laughs> that tonight. Not. Not tonight. Right. Another time. Does the board have any questions? <coughs> I, oh, go ahead. Okay, so um, you have this under historic preservation, yes. and some of it is yes. under historic preservation, but some of it probably will not qualify for historic preservation. Yeah, like we're the, waiting for you to make your judgment on that. And yeah. If you tell the, us the, certain features of it can't be funded, I know that yeah. the DPW, John Perry and his folks are going to be able to contribute some of the work, uh, yep. in, in, uh, particularly uh, maybe scraping and painting the tower. The tower itself is not a historical artifact. Right. We understand that. But uh, the moving, like the, the moving, moving part of it and that, it won't be. But there, there definitely are parts of it yeah. that qualify. How about the moving? It won't. Why do you say that? Just curious, because I sort of thought that if you're trying to preserve an historic artifact, uh, moving it to a safe place would be part of that. It's really stretching it because it's it's in a safe place now. Mm -hmm. It's just not. It's in an illegal it, place. They don't. You know, it's on private property. It's yeah. publicly owned. Yeah. But I mean, it's not. It's not in like putting it in jeopardy or anything. It, you really the the moving cost won't be. It, it doesn't fall under historic preservation, unfortunately. I know what you're saying. It's it's a nice thought, but. You know, certain parts of it will, yeah. certain parts of it won't. So Do that's what you something. can, and we'll find the rest someplace else. Yeah. Is that a deal? Yeah. That, that was going to be my question, yeah. too. It's like I don't think the moving costs would qualify. So we, we have a, a possible, uh, you know, you, you, you always ask if we're, if we're looking for other funds, and you'll, you'll ask that at the next phase of this. And uh, we may have a, a private uh, source to pay for the moving. You know. Okay. Nothing definite yet, but we're hopeful. Good. All right, no other questions. Can I have a motion to move this on uh, to historic uh, preservation? I'll make a motion that we move it um, to the next funding round under historic preservation. I second that motion. All right. Uh, roll call. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliver, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Farris, yes. Paul Machado, yes. Thank you all very much for your attention. And uh, I think these are 
relatively small projects, but they do a lot to enhance the quality of life in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the uh, change the title on it. Uh, the Interlock and Cultural Resource Stabilization Project, uh, uh, thirty-eight thousand five hundred dollars. Paul Furlan from the Water Department. That's uh, on the corner of New Boston Road, Extension East, Route Twenty-Four. Primary access is Meridian Street. Good evening tonight, committee. Uh, Paul Furlan, Administrator of Community Utilities, oversee water and sewer for the city of Fall River. I also have uh, Michael Bossy here, uh, Forester and Project Manager for the city of Fall River Water Department. The uh, Interlog and Cultural Resource Stabilization Project is something that uh, we did present to you last, last year. Uh, you did feel that uh, the majority of the project was eligible. Uh, there was a uh, portion in there last year that you cautioned us that would not be eligible, so we have removed that uh, portion of the project from the eligibility. What we want to do uh, is, uh, Interlagen is a area known of historic places. It uh, housed um, once the Arctic Ice Cold Storage Company Ice House, uh, which the ruins are still there from after the fire when the uh, wooden part of the structure was destroyed. Uh, there's also out on the Interlagen um, Peninsula is also the original Borden uh, summer home, uh, the original foundation for that and uh, walkways and stone walls around that. Um, this area has gone back to a natural vegetative state since the water department owns it and uh, we keep it uh, protected for uh, the protection of our drinking water supply, the North Wetupa Pond. The, uh, the natural vegetation has uh, started to deter deteriorate some of these ruins uh, to a point where they're unstable and they're unable to be, um, you know, brought in. A couple of years ago in 2019, prior to COVID, we started doing, uh, Mike, myself, and some other volunteers, we started doing some guided tours of this. Uh, it is restricted land, uh, as most of uh, the commission does know. Um, but we do offer guided tours uh, of that area when we're able to. So based on that, we're back in front of you for a uh, funding request of 38500 Mike, do you have anything else? <clears throat> so the, um, the funds are going to be used to hire an architect, uh, an architectural company, uh, who will assess the structures for safety, uh, give us some suggestions as how to stabilize it so that as we bring, um, you know, in, uh, visitors uh, on, in a supervised sort of, um, you know, capacity, um, we will be able to do so and really minimize the hazard to, to people who are out there. Um, I call attention to the, uh, the fact that we did remove the interpretive ranger um, accidentally in the the, head, the headline there, but mm -hmm. uh, that has been removed and that will be evidenced by the last paragraph which states that um, the interpretation that we will do will either be by, um, you know, our, our own volunteer staff or uh, potentially trained volunteers and potentially we'll find another source of funding to, uh, to perhaps hire um, a summer ranger position, but it's not part of this grant. So we adjusted the funds lower for that reason. Okay. Uh, does the board have any questions? Just one comment. It wouldn't fall under open space because we're not acquiring. So it would be recreation and historic preservation? Recreation yeah. and historic preservation. Okay. Yeah. I'll make a motion to find it eligible in mm -hmm. two categories, outdoor recreation and historic preservation. I'll, I'll second. Okay, roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliveri, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Farris, yes. Okay. Next is the Barnabas Blossom uh, Workshop Restoration, uh, 275,000. Uh, Paul Perlin's here. Uh, that's 2929 Blossom World. <clears throat> Again, thank you very much, Commission. Um, 
in front of you is uh, again a proposal that was submitted to the uh, to the board last year um, through last year's eligibility round it was found eligible uh, for funding uh, the bottomless blossom workshop restoration is a project um, of restoring a small workshop that is out in front of our reservation headquarters at 2929 Blossom Road. Um, we'd like to go in uh, with the assistance of uh, Diamond, who helped us out on a lot of different projects, uh, to go in there and restore this workshop back to uh, back to a state where it would be usable uh, potentially as a uh, as a classroom meeting space for uh, schools to be able to go out there or uh, for other uses. Mike, do you want to? Yeah, it's, it's a it's a building that we've had um, architect date to Civil War, maybe even earlier. It's got great bones, if you will. It's got timber frame uh, construction, hand hewn beams, mortise and tenon joints, pegs, um, and uh, a cut granite. Um, foundation um, but almost everything about it needs to be sort of well, either either modernized or brought up to a safety standard uh, including we will hope to make it ADA uh, accessible so that uh, as, a, as a as a place that the public can enter um, you know it won't it won't be uh, will be an inclusive uh, access but we, we already own the property right yes the reservation headquarters is actually the former Blossom Farm. Three generations of the Blossom family owned it. It was up to, it was over 300 acres in size from the North Watupa Pond to the top of Copacut Hill. And this, um, the, the, the main residence building is actually the headquarters for the watershed management operation. And surrounding it are, you know, a handful of uh, outbuildings, barns, wagon sheds, things like that, which are all uh, uh, very much of that uh, 19th century period. Okay. Any questions from the board? So can I have a motion to move this on to the next round under historic preservation? I'll make a motion that we move this to the next round under historic preservation. I'll second. Okay, roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliveira, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Farris, yes. All right. Next is the North Watupa Pond Seawall Conditions Assessment and Restoration Plan, uh, 82,500, Paul Ferlin, it's off of Bedford Street and Wilson Road. Yes, again, thank you very much, Commission. Uh, this, I believe, was presented to you uh, last year, or at least it was discussed as an idea um, to come to the board. Uh, I don't know if we made the eligibility last year, but uh, this is taking um, you know, on the north of Tupper Pond, we have the original uh, granite walls that uh, surround the pond in certain areas. Uh, some of them over by our water pumping station, the 1873 water pumping station at the bottom of Bedford Street. Uh, some of them that above um, 195 and Route 24 over in that area next to our north-south Watupper Gatehouse, uh, as well as some up on the causeway area. Uh, Wilson Road, that uh, that where you cross from uh, Wilson Road, Fall River, into the reservation area. Uh, what this really does is um, we'll get somebody out there to do a full evaluation of these walls. We know that there's work that needs to be done with them, uh, but we need to f figure out the full condition of these states and how to move forward uh, with breaking this up into little pieces for restoration, or whether we go with the larger. Um, you know, we definitely have. Um, we definitely have uh, a lot of uh, thinking to do about how the actual work is done, seeing that's in the watershed and on our drinking water supply. Uh, so that's uh, something that really needs to be looked at uh, through, the, through this project as well. Yeah. I, I <clears throat> these walls are historic, they're beautiful, and they also serve a really important function. Um, they break the wave action, you know, uh, the, the wave action and the, and the wind action of the, uh, to help prevent erosion along the, the shore and keep, you know, help in turn uh, keep the water supply, the water uh, clean. Um, there, the granite is probably um, locally sourced, you know, locally quarried granite. Um, you you almost couldn't build them like this today. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted's uh, company in the 1800s came and visited and, and was looking at uh, 
you know, potential of doing some projects there. And I think whether whether they had a hand in this, we don't we don't even have a record to know whether they really had a hand in some of these because they're just really outstanding and very unique and very uh, iconic for the city's water supply. The water supply, uh, the water works and all the buildings themselves are on the historic register, and these are kind of a nice counterpart to it, so, and, and a nice connection of the, the you know, the urban architectural, in, uh, um, you know, infrastructure, and the rural protected thousands of acres of the Watupper Reservation. So, um, it's just a nice. Uh, it, it'd be nice to, uh, similar to the interlocking work, get a handle on try to stabilize these things and uh, preserve them and, and uh, find better ways to maintain them and going to the future. They're over 100 years old. So from this, you would go to uh, an estimate cost of how much or just what needs to be repaired? Or is it, will they tell you both? Yeah, as Paul mentioned, I think, I think what we need to do is there's four different sections. Each one is different. They're in different locations, and, and even though their proximity on the pond determines what impact and you know how they're how they're holding up. So after assessing it, I think what architects will do is kind of break it up into bite-sized pieces. You know, here's you know maybe there's four projects here, maybe there's more or less, but you know here's here's a, here's a, a typical profile of a project, and then maybe from there get into estimates of how that could be done, what it would cost. Okay. Does the board have any questions? Just a comment. Um, it's it's not. It wouldn't fall into open space because I know that's checked off. Yeah. It's just historic preservation, but not open space. Yeah. All right. Can I have a motion to move this on to the next round under historic preservation? I'll make a motion that it uh, is eligible for funding under historic preservation. Second. Okay. Roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Alvin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliveri, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Rick Farris, yes. All righty. Uh, next is the Copacut Reservoir Water Supply Land Acquisition, 230000 uh, Paul Furland. That's at uh, 2450 Indian Town Road. Excellent. Thank you very much, Commission. Uh, Again, I know uh, you guys have been extremely supportive in uh, protection of our watershed lands as well as uh, a additional open space within our uh, Watapa Reservation as well as the Bio Reserve. Um, you know, all those lands uh, accompanied together makes, a, uh, makes an excellent area for open space for people to be able to, uh, to explore that area. Uh, through COVID, we've seen a uh, huge uptick of, uh, of people wanting to get outdoors uh, and using these spaces over on the other side of the North Watupper Pond. Um, so this, uh, this particular piece that, we're, uh, that we would be looking to purchase uh, this year is over next to the Copacut Reservoir and about some of our other properties that are in that area. Um, and uh, we have been in discussions with the property owner for purchase, uh, and we also do have other uh, applications that we're planning to apply for for funding. So, it's and what really makes this one um, uh, well. Actually, thank you again for your support in the past. Um, we've been able to acquire a number of parcels, open space, water supply, habitat, recreation. Uh, you know enhancing access to the bioreserve and all, and all of that's been really um, uh, uh, appreciated. Uh, this parcel uh, it will be about 16 acres in size. It will be comp it's, it's already completely surrounded by protected land on two sides by the state. Um, uh, on one side across the street by the trustees of reservations, which is our bioreserve partner. And um, on, on the east by the city of Fall River uh, land itself, the, the, uh, the reservation. Um, it's within 800 feet of the shoreline of the Copacut Reservoir, so, so it's squarely, uh, you know, an important protecting uh, parcel. And it's also adjacent to two uh, state-certified vernal pools, for, for, and marble salamander is the, is the protected species there. So there's a couple of drainage, uh, little bands of wetland on this property that actually support that, uh, vernal, that vernal pool system. And so um, by habitat standards, it's got a really, it's very, very valuable. But always in the water department, number one value is protection of the water supply. Um, we are dealing with the private owner, not with a realtor, so you know we will be able to 
you know, work expediently and, you know, not incur any extra costs uh, by paying a realtor fee or something like that. And uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to do it while it's available. Now, I, I see uh, <coughs> the owner is going to keep the single family home. Yes. Is, are we buying the waterfront of the property or does that stay with the owner? We're going to subdivide it and leave the residence with the, with, with the, you know, the, the residential lot, but we will um, protect the remainder of the property. Okay. Um, any questions? Alrighty. Can I have a motion to move this on to the next round under uh, open space? Recreation. I'll make a motion that we uh, move it to the next round on the open space and recreation. Second. Second. Roll call. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantero Oliver, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Rick Defarius, yes. yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, as Mike said before, you know, the buyer reserve is an excellent place for people to get out and explore. Uh, we've had many new partners come in. Uh, Appalachian Mountain Club has joined us uh, and they're doing guided trails out there. So that's something that people can look online to be able to get out there to do uh, activities. The trustees of the reservation had programmed activities uh, all this summer long and they're going into the fall as well. So I just want to get that out there for the public to know. Uh, the buyer reserve, the other half of Fall River is uh, open and out there. Okay. Another question, Mike, on that. Would that correct the conservation problem he has with the uh, going into the wetlands? That'll be so worked we would, out. Yeah. That would be all under this. Okay. That's nice to know. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, all. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we have the uh, Copa Cut Woods uh, Accessible Nature Play and Trail on Property Improvements. Uh, 45,265, uh, Jen Klein and Trustees of the Reservation, Indian Town Road. And, and I'm Winslow Dresser with the trustees as well. Okay. And then just let people know as we move on, too, that uh, any projects that would be approved would come with a deed restriction. Uh, so just to let you know that before we move further down the road, if that's a problem, just to let you know. Um, okay. Uh, Go ahead and tell us about your project. Great, thank you. Um, thanks for having us here. Um, Jen Klein with the Trustees of Reservations. Uh, the trustees are conceiving of and have plans to build a about 1,900 feet of accessible trail at Copacate Woods. Um, and within that trail, we are planning to include nature play elements throughout the trail. Um, so the trail it would be similar to like a fitness trail if you've seen those before but it would be in the woods um, and have little nodes along the trail where it invites young children and families to um, engage in unstructured play in the woods uh, the way that children need to experience nature and take risks and have you know experience things that are really important for their social and emotional and physical development um, for this project um, the total budget is about $122,000. Um, the trustees have received some funding um, through Mass the state of Massachusetts to cover about $50,000 of this project. Um, so we're looking to the commission here uh, to help us make up that gap so that we can make this project um, a reality and open to the public next summer. Uh, who owns the land now? The trustees. Trustees, yep. okay. Already. Um, so then it wouldn't be open space, it's just recreation. Just recreation. And it's already under a deed restriction with the state. Yeah. Okay. Does the board have any questions? Um, I have a question. Regarding the other funding you've already secured, uh, is there a time, like if you didn't get this funding, what would the, where would the project be? How, how do you kind of approach it that way? Yeah, so, um, so the state of Massachusetts is giving us two years to complete the project. So um, if this funding does not come through, we will look to other sources and um, do some internal fundraising. And if that all falls through, then we'll have to scale back the size and scope of, of what we're doing. So we're planning in the original plan, 
And with the work where we hired a landscape architect to help us sort of design and come up with some renderings and involve the community of Fall River sort of in that process of what people want to see out of that space. Um, but if that funding falls through, we might, con we originally conceived of three to five of those nature play elements along the trail. Um, with limited funding, it might be ending up being like two um, spots for nature play. Um, but it will be an accessible trail regardless of um, additional funding. So it'll be wheelchair accessible and stroller friendly for um, families. Okay. okay, and it's also located uh, pretty close to the parking areas. It's right, it, yep, so you exit the parking lot and it's right there. Yep. All right. Uh, so can I have a motion to move this on to uh, recreation? I'll make a motion that it qualifies for uh, funding under res uh, recreation category. And we have a second? Second. Okay, roll we'll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Carolina Aubin, yes. Kristen Quintero Oliver, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Paris, yes. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Like I say, any uh, other grants you can get for any of our projects that come before us is always welcome. So whatever we can chip away at our budget makes it more for everyone else. So. Absolutely. Thank Good you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, next is the Central Fire Station Exterior Restoration and North uh, Facet, uh, 644,474. We have Tammy and uh, Chief Lynch, Chief Lynch, Mike King, Mike from King. Uh, that's located on Bedford Street. Um, can I get the Chief's first name, please? John, John D. Lynch, L Y N C H. You can go ahead and tell us a little about the uh, project. I can start. Uh, the application that we put forth before you, uh, we Civic Tech Architects did a, a tour uh, some weeks back, and we performed a, a drone survey of the exterior of the building. And while just about every elevation of that building needs attention, what we are looking to do is to focus on the Bedford Street facade. Um, there was some discussion about looking at Troy Street, but um, with the amount of work that's needed for the Bedford Street, which is the main facade to, you know, visible to the public, um, we felt that we should focus there and look at buttoning up the building envelope. So part of the scope of work would be for masonry restoration, which would be cleaning the existing brick masonry, <clears throat> brick masonry repointing. Uh, there was a roof that was replaced a few years back. Um, you can see from the drone photos that you have in your, your report um, that there is some spalling of the masonry on the inside face of the parapet wall that's landing on that roof. Uh, our office is on Troy Street on the fourth floor and we can see it visually uh, just out of our of our window, it uh, doesn't appear to be in substantial danger of falling, but it is deteriorating, and that is a concern. So part of the work as well that we're proposing is that if we're going to undertake restoration of that facade, is that we'd look at all aspects of it, and meaning what we'd look at is restoration of the decorative metal panels, which is the emblem on it that you see. Um, also looking at uh, the existing air conditioners that are in the windows. <clears throat> um, one of the last things that we'd want to do is to restore that decorative metal panel system and put those AC units back in those windows only to have those leak and land on to the metal panel and start to rust. So what we proposed is for the three or four spaces on the second floor is to put in some mini splits uh, some some cooling units uh, and have some possible rooftop condensers. So these are all just what we're proposing. We haven't performed or completed a design, but um, it's a way somewhat inexpensively to provide cooling partially for that second floor and also not damage in the future the restoration work that we'd be doing. 
on the Bedford Street facade. So there's also overhead doors that we're looking at replacing, window replacement. So it's really focusing on that elevation in its totality. Do you have anyone else coming in with like, say like the air conditioners, uh, maybe someone else coming with some money for this project? For air conditioning? Yeah. So, um, you know, we wouldn't propose putting in a rooftop unit. Um, that's it's something that is possible for cooling for the remaining, you know, second floor. Um, we found that the mini splits, uh, which are smaller, I've seen it yeah, here. Yeah. They don't have any. So they're smaller, you know, almost like the size of that projector yeah. screen, maybe uh, half the width and twice the height. And you probably see them in some commercial buildings. Um, and those would just simply be piped to the roof and some small condensers that would be, say, about this high on the roof, lightweight units, nothing substantial that would require any supplemental roof framing, which we most likely would need for a rooftop unit. So I think this is a very simple way of, of getting that air conditioning for at least part of the second floor. Now you actually, have oh, I'm sorry. I was oh. going to say they're more economical, too. Um, to have those than the window units because the window units use so much more um, mm -hmm. power and it's more expensive. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, eventually what we'd like, I think we'd like to see, right, it was, we'd like to take care of the remaining elevations, you know, mm -hmm. Troy Street yeah. and those AC units that are up uh, uh, along Troy Street on the second floor as well. So that could be a potential future project, but right now we're looking at trying to focus on, on Bedford Street. Okay. Now the overhead doors, you want to replace those, right? The I'm sorry. The overhead doors, the uh, yes, yep. And we've looked at, um, you know, the chief and Tammy have sent over some photographs of what the, uh, the what they originally looked like. So that's really what we'd be looking to to go back to um, okay. as best we can. Um, and so the building was constructed in 1931. It is on the the city's register of historic places. Um, you know, we know that we would need to go before uh, Kristen and the Historical Commission as part of their review. So anything that we would propose, um, we're not proposing anything as far as the type of doors just yet. That's part of what our design would be, and it would certainly be reviewed by the Historical Commission when we get to that point. Okay. Good, good. Uh, does the Board have any questions? Chief Blanche, I was just wondering if you could speak to how the condition of the facade might impact your, your staff and doing their job. Well, right now, it's kind of like when you live in a home. And every fire station has a function, but it's also a home. So the firefighters spend a good portion of their lives living there. And it's just like your home. If you come home to something that's kind of falling down and decrepit, it, 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 it doesn't bolster you, your ego or your confidence. And the guys that are in that station love that station. There was talk years ago that they wanted to uh, eliminate that station and build basically a modern station like with a space building somewhere. Else. And I know for a fact that I spoke to all the firefighters that were stationed there. And they were opposed to it because they love the history of it. And uh, I love the history of it. And, and so that's how that would impact them also. But it also impacts everybody else. It, it impacts the community. And I want to talk a little about the history of it. If there's one fire station that has a lot of historical value, it's the center station. We have a lot of stations that are older. Stanley Street Station is the oldest functioning station right now on Stanley Street, built in 1911. And we had the fire museum and that was built in the 1800s. But the center station has so much more historical value because it was the first station that was built in the modern era. It was built for mechanized fire trucks. All the other stations were built for horse and wagons. So it was the first one ever built. And it was built because in 1928, the Great Fire of 1928 burnt the whole center of the city out. And the old central station was basically almost on their site there. And if you remember, back then, Fall River was in a depression before the rest of the country was, because all the mills had moved out. So in addition to Fall River being in a depressed era, 
and have the center of the station of the city burnt out, they found the funds to build this brand new station. And when they built it, they built it like a fortress. And some other historical things that you don't know about it, if you walk in that center station with the apparatuses and you look at the ceiling, it's called Waffle Ceiling, right? It was actually designed by MIT. And it was the first uh, municipal commercial use of that type of ceiling. So that also is historical. You know, and then it housed not only the fire apparatus and the firefighters, but it housed all the staff. The chief's office was there. Fire prevention was there. They had the repair shop in the back. If you walk in the back, the repair shop is still there, where they used to fix the brand new fire trucks. So there's a lot of historical value there. And uh, I, I think this is the first piece that really needs to be done because the station really has been neglected until when you gave us money to fix the roof. And that's our biggest concern. Fix the envelope, restore that front facade on Bethel Street, and bring it back. I'm not sure if you have the pictures of the original building. And you can see all everything is still intact except that it's corroded. It, it, it's, it's falling down. Were they giving those pictures, Tammy? No. Because I just received them. All right. So if you want to pass these around, that's when it was built. And look at the car there, right? You know this is old. So this is the, basically the current condition of it. So actually, air conditioning would help preserve the inside of the building. Yes. Okay. And, and the outside. And the outside. Like yeah. Mike was saying, those yeah. air conditioners, they leak. But they're not historical. They, you know, you see those right. windows. There's, it's an eyesore, you know, yeah. It is an eyesore. It's a beautiful building to walk by, uh, you know, historic-wise. It's, you know. Yeah. You're welcome. That tall one there, Chief? What's that? Is that call one? I, it might be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, does the board have any questions on this? Um, I may, at the, at the time of the funding round, I may have some questions about why the city doesn't fund repairs to municipal buildings. Um, that's probably something that I think should be addressed. You know, um, there should be a fund, I think, that uh, you know, keeps, keeps buildings like this in repair. Not just dependent on CPA, but that's for another day. I agree. Yeah, it would, it would be nice if you, we invest six hundred and forty-five thousand dollars. Be nice to see maintained, you know, beyond us, you know. So. Well, I've actually gone before the city council, and we discussed this probably about three weeks ago. So we are in discussions that the city is going to look into devoting some money to this. But I think this is a good first step because yeah. this money is available right now. And you know the wheels of government turn very slowly. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah. I think that if we get rolling with this here and we're able to bring back that front facade, you know, yeah. it brings a pride in, in, in the building and oh, the yeah. fire department itself. And that could drive the city council, the city administration to say, let's yeah. stop dragging our feet yeah. mm -hmm. and let's devote the money that's that's used for this because that building is not just historic and beautiful it is so such a functional building that thing still remain a fire station a hundred years from now and still be viable yeah you know and that's an important part of it not just is it historical but it's very very functional still yeah all uh, so can I have a motion to move this to the next round under historic preservation I'll make a motion that we move this to the next round under historic preservation I'll second. Uh, roll call. Alexander Silva, yes. Carolina Alvin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliver, yes. Um, excuse me. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Farris, yes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We'll see you the next round. <laughs> we'll see you then. 
Uh, next, uh, under nonprofit projects, we have Watupa Rowing Center and Docks and Lane Marking System. We missed two the two fire fire. Fire. Oh, you forget to see two fire things. I got all mixed up there. Uh, so, sorry about that. It's Fall River Fire Museum and repair items required to open to the general public. Uh, $300,500. Uh, Michael LePage, North not Main here. Street. Okay, he's not here. Um, does the board have any questions on this one? I would make a motion to uh, this to uh, say that this project is el eligible in the historic preservation category, particularly since we funded it in the past and yeah, found that. I agree. Uh, okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay. Roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Carolina Alpin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliver, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Farris, yes. Okay, moves to the next round. Okay, the Watupa Rowing Center docks and lane marking, 200,000. Paul? Yes. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, committee members, for, for allowing us to be uh, uh, participating this evening. Uh, my name is Paul Cloutier. I know it says uh, Bay Coast Bank on here, but I'm the board chair of the Watupa Rowing Center. Now I see you have uh, lane markers, uh, a floating dock, and what else is there? Uh, my only question is now, uh, some of it looks like we could fund, but now is, say the floating docks, is that open to the public where you can go down and put a kayak in, or is that just for... So not, not presently, right now the docks um, that we have were purchased by the board specifically for the rowing center. Um, due to the nature of the equipment and what we have uh, at the center, um, it's not uh, viable to have the public using the docks and using, you know, being able to be at the boathouse uh, in the property because sometimes the boats are left outside in certain equipment. So for this time, you know, at this point in time, um, we are open to the public as far as, you know, high school students being able to participate. Um, adults can come down and row in our programs, but right now it's not um, open public space. <coughs> But, but the people who sign up for the classes get to use that. A hundred percent. Yep, correct. Okay, already. Um, let's see, can uh, board members have any questions? Um, I saw in your application that it says you currently lease the building and property from the city. Is that yes, from two gentlemen who were here a minute ago, Paul so, Ferro and Michael Bossier. So if this grant were awarded, you were able to fund the infrastructure yep. improvements? Would that infrastructure belong to the city or what type of rowing center? Uh, what type of rowing center? Okay. okay. Um, I, do, I do have uh, some questions. Sure. But they're not relevant to this eligibility proceeding, just something that I would ask you to consider for the funding round. Yep. Um, so it's my understanding from what I read in the eligibility application is that not every venue qualifies like the Watapa Pond qualifies. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that there are rowing centers in other communities? There are some, correct, yes. Okay. And those attract tourists and... Very much so. Okay. Um, I would be very interested in the future, in the funding application, to learn why the Watapa Pond is such a good rowing venue, mm -hmm. and um, what other communities have rowing venues, and um, you know how, how many tourists they attract or how many yeah. participants they yeah. attract, because obviously we're spending public money, mm -hmm. so the impact on the public is a very important consideration right. for us. Great. Okay, Thank but you. that's not relevant to tonight's yeah. eligibility, <laughs> but yeah. just an idea for the funding yeah. Thank application. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Can we have a motion to move this on to the next round under uh, recreation? I'd make a motion that this qualifies in the recreation category. I'll second. Uh, roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliver, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Farris, yes. All righty. Great. Thank you all very much. Have a good night. Thank you. You Thank too. You. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is the Dr. Fisk House. 
Uh, one hundred and seventy thousand uh, dollars. Uh, Jim Sewell and the Pres uh, Forward Preservation Society on Pine Street. Is there anyone here for Jim? I know this has been a project we uh, worked on in the past, mm -hmm. and this is to do uh, the clapboard on the west wall and uh, prime the cedars um, and shingle and roof work. So. Uh, I would make a motion that this qualifies in the historic preservation category, um, particularly because we've already previously yeah. funded it. Yep, I'll second that. Okay, roll call vote. I'm refusing myself. I'm on the board of directors. Okay. Caroline Alvin, yes. Krista Cantera Oliver, yes. Uh, Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Nick Nefarious, yes. Project moves on. Uh, next is the Antioch School Exterior Restoration Phase 1, uh, $234,878, Diane Carrera, Vice Principal, and where is that little, uh, 618, 618 Rock, Rock Street? Street. Mm -hmm. Just to let the public know. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm John Frost. I'm the principal. John Frost, F R O S T. I am the principal. It's Diane Correa. Yes. Vice principal. Mike Keen, Civitex Architects. And Ann Keen, Civitex Architects. All right, you want to tell us a little about your project? Um, <clears throat> I can speak to that. Okay. And uh, let me just say thank you again for having us here before you. Um, the initial discussion with the school um, was to look at a recreation of the Port Cochere, which is the front porch of this uh, historic property, which is <clears throat> on the, uh, the register, the Fall River Register of National Places. It's also on within the National uh, Historic District as well on Rock Street. And the initial discussion, as I mentioned, was to recreate the Port Cochere and uh, it was just well, knocked down about maybe 20 years or so ago. Yes. Um, it was dilapidated, it was falling down, it posed a, a safety hazard. Uh, however, 20 years ago, they were encouraged by the Historical Society Correct. to document uh, as best they could the conditions of that poor crochet. So in, what we've included in some of the, the evaluation are some photographs that the school had provided us with um, and there's some nice detailed shots of that pro share, which is uh, which is more than what we typically see. Um, so that's extremely helpful for us as architects to look at possibly recreating that pro crochet. That's just only a sample. I mean, there are dozens and dozens of photographs mm -hmm. of that pro crochet. Uh, however, um, the more that we started to get into it and look at the building in in total. Uh, we felt that the first phase really should be to look at the exterior siding of the building. And that is what we've been focusing on looking at is, is its existing wood shingle siding really needs to be replaced. The building needs to be insulated. Uh, we've had um, some contractors come out and look at that to pro stop providing us with some cost estimates. Um, and the roof itself was done several years ago, so I don't think that that's really in need of any attention. Uh, this, the same with the gutters. It's really the exterior cladding system. And so we've we put forth before you a phase one and a phase two, but really all we're looking for is, is phase one now at the moment with the anticipation that, you know, hopefully we can come back and, and request funding for phase two. But um, I'd really hate to see um, a start work on a Port Cochere, but the rest of the building is in dire need of, of attention. Uh, so that's really what we focused on here in the in what we put before you. We did um, assist the school, and we sent our um, some of our other architects in our firm out to survey the building and to you know measure everything, and we drafted um, exterior elevations for the school. So there's there's some you know participation in, on the school's part in retaining us to do to do some of that effort, um, and we also had our drone out there too to do a flyby and to do some some inspection. Um, 
I, I did want to say that there is some masonry repointing. It's not substantial, but where the original chimneys are for this this residence, former residence, uh, there is some minor repointing that really should be done as part of this, and uh, we put that into our proposal as well. Okay. Uh, if I didn't mention already, the the school, you know, is historic, but it's also a nonprofit as well. Okay. All right. Uh, have you looked at other funding sources too? To help with some That's of the what we're hoping. Um, okay. All right. Uh, state, and we're also hoping um, fundraising among families. Okay. That type of thing. Deed restriction, no problem. No, no okay. problem. No. All righty. Uh, does the board have any questions? Just um, you you should come also before the historical commission yeah. to mm -hmm. to get a, a letter of support from sure. us. Sure. Okay. So yeah. our next our next meeting is October nineteenth. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, can I have a motion to move this on to the next round under historic preservation? I'll make a motion to move this under historic preservation to the funding round. I'll second. Okay, roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliver, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Perry, yes, yes. Okay. So Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so everyone. much. Thank you. If you have any questions, give us a holler. Always glad to have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Alrighty, next is the Greater Fall River Arts Association uh, East uh, Valuation Restoration, uh, two hundred eighty-three thousand one hundred and forty. Diana Barnes, President of Greater Fall River Arts Association on Belmont Street. Can I make one correction? The name is Dana. Dana. Okay. Sorry about <laughs> Sorry that. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I, I heard her name. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm not sure what what I can um, add other than what we've already um, come up with here. The Greater Fall River Art Association has been in existence since 1957. Um, we've owned the building since 1969. It was gifted to the Art Association, so we own it outright. Um, it's at 80 Belmont, and um, it's a it's an amazing building. Um, and we, as an art association, have. Have, are in a really unique situation where we are obligated to do art and we have classes and we have artist studios and all of those good things and we you know do community service projects for you know that benefit the community we have quite a few classes where kids come of all ages and adults and and we do monthly um, art exhibits and we've just added music to our repertoire some spoken word for next year I mean we we've, we've been planning to come out of COVID and, and continue on the work that we do. But on the other side, we also have this beautiful historic building. And it is, an, it is a phenomenal building. Um, the front porch, the front facade, which is what we're looking at here. And we've, we've talked to Mike Keene, who actually used to take classes at the Art Association. Mm -hmm. And I'm, what I'm, thing I'm finding is that quite a few people who have come into this building have said, oh, I used to come here and take classes. And lo and behold, some of their children and grandchildren are now coming to take classes, which is which is pretty exciting. But we have this beautiful building, and um, so that's the other side of, of, of who we are as an association. Um, the association has been given permission by the Smithsonian to hang <clears throat> uh, 40 pieces of works progress art inside the building. So we, um, we are honored that they gave us permission to do this, and we have 35 of them hanging right now in their own gallery in the, what we call the Grand Staircase in the house. It's a phenomenal exhibit. I encourage every single one of you to come into this building and see this exhibit. You will not find this anywhere outside of maybe, um, I do know there's a museum that houses this kind of art out in Western Mass, and there is also one in, in, in um, Arizona, I do believe. But um, the Smithsonian, I called them and I said, can I, what can I do with these? Because they're in storage and they need to be, they need to be seen. Mm. So they are hanging now. And we are honored that we have these hanging in our, in our um, in, interior. Um, all of that being said, our exterior needs some help. You know, we're a nonprofit arts organization and we, we, we do raise funds as best as we can. Um, we have a membership list. Uh, we've been writing some grants. We've been able to get some um, assistance from community builders to help our programming. And I'm in, engaged with um, some of their 
their folks to help, you know, how we can fundraise even more um, for, for nonprofits and things like that. And, and we're working hard at that. And I do have a young uh, a person who used to go, used to be a, a student at the Art Association who is now um, working with us to help us do some grant writing, which is very helpful to me. Um, but I, I like my, um, Mike and Ann have been um, just amazing to work with. And, and they've been very helpful in terms of, of helping me figure out what we need to do for this big, beautiful building. So I would like, I would like for him to talk about what we need. He's so much better than I am at this part of this. I can talk about some of this, but this, he's so much better at this. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, and equally, the feeling is mutual. It's been a, a great partnership so far, uh, <laughs> and it will be, yes. uh, continuing on. So uh, what we did, um, we came in, we looked at the building, we um, you know, sent some of our architects in again and field surveyed the building interior and the exterior to try to look at, we spent quite a bit of time and actually with, with Dana and Coach Fair and the rest of the, the board to talk about um, what potentially we could look at for you know, our initial projects. And I think the first thing is, is like we've been saying with some of the other projects, is looking at the exterior envelope first and in particular uh, the, the facade along Belmont Street and the porch is in substantial need of restoration. Um, so the columns, some of the spindles as well. Um, and, you know, it's sort of, where do you stop? There's still some roof work that needs to be done for that porch. Uh, there is an existing fire escape as well for the upper floor that services the upper floor. And one of the things that we're proposing is to potentially uh, relocate that fire escape. So that's, that's a part of that as well. We did, um, you know, had a similar project on Highland Avenue, just right around the corner from this structure uh, near the fire barn, maybe two or three years ago, which we restored the exterior in its entirety. Um, and it, went, it was quite successful. And we had a, a fire escape along Highland Avenue, um, and we relocated that to the north side of the building. So there's a little bit of a code analysis, there's an egress analysis that would need to be done. That's sort of our next step in everything, uh, to look to see if we could do that. Um, so it's not something that you see front and center on Belmont Street. So there's a little bit of roof replacement, gutters, downs, it's just sort of a whole mix of, of different things. So um, we're trying to look at that facade in its totality. <laughs> I know I walk by the building quite often, and uh, <laughs> those have a gorgeous porch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the last time you had a uh, kids, uh, teaching kids art. And kids Day? Something. Yes, we have kids art, and we also have, um, oh, we do a annual art on the porch, where we actually put our art out on the porch. I, and, I picked um, in a little bit. I didn't want to yeah. interrupt the class, so I was like, I, was Absolutely. Talking to, I guess a parent whose kids were in there, so I was like, oh, I thought that yep. was nice. Yep. And so, it's, it gives people a nice place to wait for their kids. Yeah. So no problem with the deed restriction? Nope. Okay. Does the board have any questions? When was this building built? 1904. Yeah. 1904. And the person who owned it was Charles Mariner Cole. He was a salvage seaman out of, uh, worked in, out, in, um, out in the bay. And um, his great-grandson, great-great-grandson, actually, I met him. He's come to the house. First time in the house was last month. Hmm. And um, he gave a wonderful talk. He's he's related to an awful lot of people in the city. Yeah. Hmm. Um, he's related to the Hargra Har Hargraves, yeah, Hargraves. Hargraves who had the mills. He's also related to the McLeans, and his name is Cole. And yes, the Cole River is part of who he is and his family. Hmm. And we're in Twisset. So yeah. he um, when he came and gave that conversation, everybody was just flabbergasted. Hmm. But I have to tell you, the one thing that that blew my brain is when he walked into that house. And there, he has a family history in that house that no, none of us have. Hmm. And every single emotion you could possibly have hmm. uh, ran across his face when he walked into that house. He yeah. is 200% behind this project. I think whatever I needed to do, um, I do have a letter of recommendation from him because this is this is important piece of his family history, but it's also important for the city. Okay. You know, when you, in, in my opinion, when you, um, file the funding application. Yep. I think what was, would be very helpful is if you elaborate on what you told us tonight about how the building's used, about the students. Okay. 
I, I, I wasn't aware of that. Absolutely. So, happy you know, to do happy to do that. That'll be I think that would be helpful. Okay. And all the other public events that you yeah. have because you have the public the galleries and, and things yeah. like that. I actually have been in the building several times and I, I went to an exhibit there a couple of weeks ago. It was just a, a public exhibit and I got to see the um, the WPA, WPA exhibit and it's just it's amazing. It really just to, to have something like that in the city and people yeah. aren't aren't even aware of it. Right. But anybody can go in and see this and the building itself is just it's stunning yeah. it's just yeah. a stunning building but just besides that what they do with it thank you and i know you have some fun don't you have a, a thing this weekend your yard sale is um yes we have a yard uh, one yeah. of the you know we've been fundraising left and right i've been having we've been having music in the building um think intimate coffee house and you know that's part of our fundraising we have a yard sale coming up this weekend um, we're trying to do little things as best as we can. We have paint nights and stuff like that. Our classes are very well attended. Our, our shows have been, are, are coming back. It's, it was a challenge for a little while. Um, but our classes have, have just started to take off. We started out with one little kids class, one middle kids class, and one, adult, one um, high school class. And now I'm up to two of each of them. And they're filling up. I'm rapidly trying to find more. T I'm scrambling, trying to find more art teachers and more mm -hmm. To, to help me to help do this because I can't blow up all my <laughs> all my volunteers. <laughs> yeah. So we're 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 excited. It seems to be um, turned a corner and moving in a in a direction, and we want our beautiful home to to look good when you first walk up to it. Yeah. Any more other questions? And I'm just going to ask Kristen, yeah. and this goes for all applicants yeah. for the funding round. Yeah. That it would be very helpful to us and the community if you put some numbers or data together that shows how much you've invested yourselves in okay. the property. It sure. kind of just goes to show your commitment to it as well. Okay. You might want to mention. I know um, Coach Bear has done so much work. Um, yes, the, the gentleman that's sitting the, behind here, um, for those of you who might not know him, or you, might, you probably do, I don't know too many people in the city who don't know Coach Bear, uh, Ron Gagnon, um, he was um, instrumental in getting the um, interior on the, of the gallery floor, of the gallery level, um, restored to its, to its um, uh, historic luster. I mean, we have, we have uh, pulleys and rope windows. He redid all of those to the best that we can. There's some there's some weights and pulleys that are like, you know, three feet long and you can't get them out. But he's been doing an awful lot of work there. We sanded all the floors. Um, he rebuilt one of the fireplaces. And how I met Mr. Black was when he was cleaning out one of the areas around one of the fireplaces, a bunch of single edge razor blades fell out. And he cut his hand on one and I posted a very snarky picture. And I said, you never know what you're going to meet, what, find when you do a renovation. And lo and behold, Bruce Black, who is the great-grandson, said, if you are still at 80 Belmont, those are probably my great-grandfathers. And that started this whole process. Oh. But, you know, we've got, we, we do all our work by volunteer. We have very little, like, I mean, obviously the things that we need to have done with a professional we do. But for the most part, and for the most part this past year, it's been him. Unfortunately, I, I, I blew up my, my best uh, volunteer, so I have to, I'm finding some more. <laughs> but he's still the boss. He still makes everybody um, do the things that we need to have done. He's, he's a great person to have on this, on this board. It was the best thing I ever did. Took him away from football. Yeah. All righty. So can I have a, a motion to move this on to the next round under store preservation? I'll make a motion. Thank you. That will move with the next round on the historic preservation. I'll second. Okay, roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliver, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brent, yes. Victor Farris, yes. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your time. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, next is a uh, historic St. Anne's Church exterior restoration. Uh, 150,000, uh, Brad Paul, uh, St. Anne's Preservation Society, South Main Street. Hi, my name is uh, Bob Garvin. Uh, I'm uh, financial secretary for the board of directors for the St. Anne's Shrine Preservation Society. Uh, Brad Paul uh, is in uh, San Francisco, and he is our uh, national chairperson. We have a national committee raising money to uh, preserve the church. Um, just to let you know a little bit about what happened. <clears throat> uh, three years ago, the diocese closed the church, um, and we <clears throat> we uh, formed a nonprofit corporation and went to the bishop, 
and ask them if we could have a lease uh, for uh, for a period of time, okay. and it ended up being 10 years. Uh, for, and they gave us a lease for a dollar a year, uh, with the understanding that we had to pay the utilities and all the insurance, and and, and do restoration. Uh, we're all volunteers. Uh, nobody gets a paycheck. Um, the shrine is open every single day. We usually have two people, uh, usually a man and a woman, because we have the bathrooms to, to look at after, um, you know, in the shrine. We have a gift shop there. Um, so right now we're open 10 to 4 every day. And on Sundays we're open 12 to, to 4. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've done, uh, we've been pretty successful uh, in the first two years that we've run uh, the shrine. We've, uh, we've raised uh, $225,000. It would have been more if it hadn't been for COVID because we, we were open more hours. Uh, but um, uh, we have a board of directors. Um, we have um, a contractor, uh, a chief financial officer, um, an uh, engineer for a national grid, a mechanical engineer, uh, we have li some liturgical people um, that were went to seminary school, um, and um, we have a retired uh, uh, bank employee, uh, also a social worker. So we have a very diverse board of directors, and um, uh, you know our goal is to keep the shrine open um, and to restore the the, the, the church. Um, and um, we've had a lot of people who have uh, done things for us for free. Because uh, we have had done some, there's a shrine downstairs, but there's the church upstairs. Uh, the church is on the National Register of Historic Places. And um, uh, we've had people come in, uh, contractors, um, electricians, uh, and do work in the shrine downstairs for free. Um, we had somebody put in a new fire alarm because the city wanted uh, uh, new fire alarms. We put those in. Um, you know, we've sealed the. Um, there's wa there was water coming in um, when we first got there. There was water, mold, and it was just just falling apart. So if you go into the shrine today, you find that it's in pretty it's the best shape it's ever been. Um, and um, so um, you know, right now, uh, Brad Paul is uh, from Fall River originally. He's uh, uh, works in the government of in San Francisco. And um, <clears throat> he's running a national campaign, and what we're, what we're looking to do is it's, it's about $650,000 to fix the roof. And uh, that's like the first, first thing that's got to get done. Now, to replace the roof, it's about $2 million. <laughs> but we've had uh, uh, three firms come in. They've had drones. And some people have gone up there. There's the actual, the church was built to last 500 years, not 100 years. It was, you know, it was opened in 1906. And um, the, 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 actually, the roof is in pretty good shape. Um, it's just the valleys um, that where, you know, they, you know there's, there's valleys there. And, um, the, and that's what we need to fix. They have to pull all those uh, slate to pot, and they have to, the, you know, the flashing has to be replaced with modern flashing because the flashing is, you know, over 100 years old. Um, and what's happening is the, the water is getting into the walls. And it's it's not, you know, people say the roof's leaking. The roof's not leaking. It's it's coming into the valley. It's going into the walls. So after you have a big st st uh, storm, there's no water in the church, um, and um, it's it's just getting into the walls. And I, and I, I do have some pictures um, I'd like to share with you. Uh, these pictures show you some of the damage on on the roof, and then. The damage that it does, um, that it's doing to uh, some of the artwork that's inside, um, inside the, the, the building. Um, so um, it's it's the biggest church in the diocese of Fall River. Upstairs can fit 2,000 people, um, and um, it's got the one of the biggest um, organs, pipe organs, uh, in New England. It's got over 3,300 pipes, um, and so we have to heat that. You know, you know, we've made 225,000, but we've paid for the heat. We have to heat the whole building because of the uh, uh, the uh, sprinklers and um, because of that pipe organ. That pipe organ in place is worth um, 
two million dollars, and uh, it's quite the it's 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 quite the pipe organ. So you know our plans, um, you know we're full bore. We're getting a lot of support um, from um, um, all over the country. People actually people are asking us, um, you know how we're doing it, and we're actually becoming a model for the for, for nationwide because there's only like four shrines in the United States that are run by lay people. And um, in all honesty, you know, our group knows more about maintaining the building and fixing the building than priests. The, the priests don't get, you know, don't get lessons in that. So, so you know, it's, thank you. It's really, you know, it's really falling apart. And, you know, it's our goal to uh, uh, get it into what I would call Bristol condition for upstairs and get the, the upstairs uh, up, up and running. This is just the, you know, this is a draft of the, our capital campaign, you know, talking about us and talking about what we accomplished and all the different costs. But this is just phase one. Stop the roof from leaking um, and then start repairing the, the inside. And um, and that's about all I have to say. I don't know if you have any questions or... Now, if moving forward, you would have uh, bids coming before us? What do you mean by the work? Well, we, uh, our plan is to, we're going to, our plan is that we're going to contribute, we've already raised, a, we're set aside 150000 for this. You know, if you raised 150000 by the time your money became available, we would rate, have matched it again with 150000 And Brad Paul is, is trying to, on a national level, get, mm -hmm. get wealthy people to write some big checks for us. Yeah. So it's really a combination of all, all those items to get this, this roof fixed. Okay. Yeah, because we need like bids of what it's going to be used, make sure it follows the Secretary of Standards. Mm -hmm. You know, like when the roof is being done, it's got to be to a store. Well, we're going to have an architect once, once, okay. once we we will hire an architect to oversee that. But um, you know, up, you know the um, from you know we would go before the historical commission, obviously. But there's um, all the slates that we're we're taking out are going to go back in. Mm -hmm. It's just that the flashing and and, and the, uh, the modern materials that they're going to use to make sure that the water gets away from the. Um, um, from the from the building from the from the roof. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't know if modern materials would be qualified under historic preservation. Well, so it would be underneath no, the flasher. No, under the. It's oh, under, under, it's oh, under the flasher. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, it's like a, it's like a. I guess it's like this composite, um, like a sponge, and it, and it. Whereas now the water just stays okay. there. We just take and it away. The slate goes yeah, over yeah, that. Yeah, oh, yeah, right. yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Right. So uh, uh, I've learned a lot about buttresses and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? Yeah, I have or, a question. Yeah. First off, I just commend you for all of your work in preserving the second like building for the city. You. I do have one big question though, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if you're going to be able to provide me with an answer. So, in order to accept one of these grants, the mm -hmm. owner of the property, which I understand is the diocese, right. would need to agree to a historic preservation deed restriction mm -hmm. on the property for a number of years. Is that has that been talked about? Has that been agreed upon? We would, if without whatever those details are, we would present to the um, we would present to the diocese. Okay. Um, so the diocese is very happy with what we're doing. They initially we start we started talking about a twenty year uh, lease, uh, but then we said they said well, okay we'll do it for ten, but we're pretty sure that the way things are going um, and the attention we're getting that uh, you know we're gonna gonna be there for a while. Okay. We're going to need confirmation before okay. any grant so, is awarded that the diocese would agree to a preservation deed. Okay. Is there anywhere I can get the wording on that? or? Um, the wording should be on our website, okay. but I think we can get to you whatever wording you're mm -hmm. looking for. Okay. Essentially, it just needs to be a preservation a minimum so, of 30 okay. years. 30 years. Yeah. Okay. Deed restriction okay. for preservation purposes. So I just, that just needs to be... Yeah. We have to know that as soon as possible, well, I think. It's supposed to be there for 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Another nice thing might be uh, uh, the historic value of the church. How many people come by, I mean, tourists, everything like that, to visit yeah. the park. And uh, I know it's a church, and, and that's good. But, you know, anything else that the building adds to... People okay, would that be for the next story. round of yeah. this? Okay, yeah, you know. yeah, because we are starting pilgrimages, um, and um, 
we are going to do tours once we get upstairs because that's really, you know, and, um, and also uh, we, we, we get about, on a bad day we get about 30 people and on a, on a, a good day we get 75 and on our feast we had 500 people and we advertise in Boston, Providence and Fall River and we got people from New York City um, and there's a lot of healings and things like that that, that people could keep on coming back. Um, people today, in the old days, they used to just open the shrine and people would go in. Uh, but now we have pe people feel safer because they know there's there's two people in the gift shop at all times. So uh, the, we've been people have commented on that. That you know, I never used to go because you know people would be walking around and they were, they were scared. But you know, we've been able to to, to maintain that. But we'll look into that deep restriction and uh, give you some more some numbers on <coughs> what we. Have. Um, there's also, um, these are public funds, mm -hmm. and while there are some communities that have funded the restoration of historic religious buildings, mm -hmm. there's at least one community where a grant to a church resulted in litigation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and it was kind of a complicated litigation. And the essence of the decision mm -hmm. um, is that among the factors that would be relevant would be, is there a public use to the building, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just a religious use. Right. So in terms of the funding round in the funding application, if, for example, um, there is a... Uh, you know, a food bank that takes place every so often, or if there's... We, there is. We do have that. Okay. Yeah. Then that, you should put that in the application and make sure that you emphasize mm -hmm. a public uh, purpose for the for the church as opposed okay. to a religious purpose. Okay. Yeah. Any other group that might meet there, too, yeah. make sure mm -hmm. you include that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. To be honest with you, I didn't, I didn't think we were going to be eligible. But Brad called me, called me, and said, because it's the outside of the church and it's historic, um, so so that's yeah. really kind of why we said, okay, let's let, let's it, let's do it. So the, the, it'll help. The more you can add, the more the community yeah. uses it. Besides right. religious, yeah, you know, yeah. and then like I say, people to drive by to look at it. I mean, you can see that coming over to Bragger Bridge. So yeah, I mean, yeah, it yeah. is a historic, yeah. you know, so. And, and, and if there's a historical background, so for example, if there were parishioners who were locally famous, um, that would be important information to include. Okay. Okay. The other thing, too, to consider, um, if it's agreed, if the diocese agrees to the preservation restriction, that means that nothing can happen to that building for however period of time. And this, mm -hmm. you're not talking like, a, a regular sort of historic building. This is an iconic mm -hmm. structure yeah. to the skyline of the city. From what I understand, they actually, they use it as a navigation tool, like from the airplane, ocean, yeah, we'll use it, um, yeah, like sailors use it as yeah. a navigation point. Yeah. 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 So um, that's yeah. one thing to consider too, with looking at a public benefit is the building, yeah, will, the, it will be saved, yeah. and the, the fact that it's so historically and architecturally significant also is a public benefit, so yeah. that's something. Yeah, yeah. yeah but so. if you saw some of those uh, paintings that deteriorating, you know, it, it's terrible. You know? It is. Um, actually, we're going to go to Rhode Island School of Design to see if their apprenticeships will restore that for mm -hmm. us, you know. So um, so we got a lot, a lot going on, and um, you know, we're really happy the way, the way things are going, because when we first went in and met with the diocese, mm -hmm. we had no money. <laughs> we just had a, a, a thing from the state saying we were a nonprofit, and uh, if St. Anne's Hospital wanted it for a parking lot, they were going to take it. I mean, we, could, we couldn't compete against that. Right. What, um, what's the rect? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, what's the rectory going to be used for? The rectory is already a low, uh, low. Uh, Income housing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah. housing. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. house. Yeah. 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 This is Cecile Michel. She's our treasurer. And it's for underfunded seniors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Cecile. Eighteen apart. Cecile Michel. Michel. Yeah. Michel. Yeah. No, Michel. I'm sorry. Michel. M-I-C-H-N-O. Um. But yeah, I mean, it, it's it's like. 
it's almost two million dollars to knock the church down. That's mm -hmm. the other thing, uh, because it's all uh, Vermont Blue Room Vermont model, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, so we're starting there, and like I said, we're we're, we're doing very very well. Mm -hmm. So the other building is connected to the church, though, right? Uh, it, it's a hallway or a yeah, but it's not. I mean, there's you could no. You probably thing. include that in your, you know, yeah. too. I think that would help. Yeah, well, there's a separate like organization. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Just if you want to come to the before the historical yeah. commission meeting, Brad has my information anyway to contact me. So okay. Okay. we can. We're meeting in October. We're meeting in November. We meet the third Tuesday of every month. Okay. So just get in touch and we can get you on the agenda. Okay. okay. So can I have a motion to move this on to the next round under historic preservation? I'll make a motion to move this to the funding round under historic preservation. I'll second that. Okay, roll call. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliver, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Vic Defarius, yes. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. If you have any questions, give us a holler. We'll be glad to. Okay, next is private uh, uh, projects. Uh, first, we have 35-56 Water Street windows replacements and limited masonry restoration, uh, $127,500. Uh, Jeannie, I always say your last name wrong. Uh, Padilla. Padilla. <laughs> And these are a realty trust that uh, that's located at 36-56 Water Street. Correct. And Jim. And Jim. And Jim. And Mike. Hi. Hello. Wow, so many great projects before us. That was a lot of information. Um, we're happy to be here again and grateful for the opportunity and thank you for doing what you do. This is a long night for you guys, huh? So we're here again in, um, you know, obviously you know that we were not um, given the last request for the CPA funding. And, you know, we, looking at this list, I just have to say that, I mean, there are so many good projects and I understand that, um, where, they're, where they're public and, Nonprofit. Um, so where we are eligible to apply, I'm just asking you to please, you know, listen to what we are asking for, and I really appreciate your consideration. Mm -hmm. And I would like Mike, we, Mike and uh, Jim and I and Anne had a long um, discussion about uh, the roof request that we made, and you know, things that I had learned that we reassessed everything and. Um, no, we're just looking to to keep this building historically preserved and move forward after the decades that we have um, committed ourselves to being part of the city and the waterfront district and all of the exciting things that are happening um, that are coming up. We're you know happy to be a part of it, and we just are looking forward to keeping to, to making it better and to preserving. And um, Mike has mo more information yeah, than we, Mike. So we did have <coughs> we did have quite a few discussions. Uh, we knew we wanted to submit another application. Uh, the the study for the building, which was also a CPA funded project, we completed. Um, so we had some quite a bit of uh, discussion about what to apply for next. And then, this uh, the last discussion that we had um, is actually I think a pretty good segue into why we headed in this direction because if I recall <coughs> um, one of the discussions that we had last year uh, was what is really the benefit of a roof replacement um, for a building what's the benefit from the public view and here we have a property that's along the waterfront it's definitely historic um, but what is the public benefit when we have the waterfront being revitalized? And so for that reason, we, sh we shifted uh, to looking at a window replacement for the building. 
and hopefully you all have a copy or received a copy of our study, uh, which I think was extensive in terms of the phasing and what we were recommending in terms of what those potential future projects could be. Uh, really, the next one was window replacement um, after, after the roof. And so um, what I found and our office found and some of the preservationists that we have that work you know, on our staff, um, we were just sort of winding down the study when we had submitted our, our initial application. And we found some pretty interesting things about the history of the building. Uh, the fact that it had served originally as the Metacomet Bank, the main branch of the Metacomet Bank, before it was part of the Ironworks complex. Um, Megan, who's one of our preservationists in our, in our office, um, did quite a bit of, of research and digging. And from that, we were able to find some of the original um, you know, maps, and Sanborn maps, in addition to photographs of the building. And so we know what that building looked like. We know what the window configuration originally looked like for that building. And what I think was equally impressive um, we were able to find is, is additional information from the 1941 fire that occurred, the Firestone Mill fire that occurred across the street from this, this structure and wiped out the upper floors of the building. And, and, and now all we have are, are, is just the remaining first floor part of the structure. Um, we even found, and I'm not sure if you, if you got the link to it in the, in the study, but there is a, a 1941 news with reel of the property that does a flyby of the fire as it's occurring and as the structure is being burned down. So it's pretty impressive. Um, so again, what we what we decided to focus on and shift is the is the historic window. Uh, it's actually going to have to be a, uh, a recreation, right? The the windows are no longer there. We do have um, metal windows that have failed and they're rusted. If you see in some of the line items of what we've included in the proposal is some um, language in there about mason restoration. The mason restoration is not, is not fully the entire building. It's only limited to those areas that will be impacted by the window replacement. So I just want to be clear on, on that piece of it. So there's going to be some repointing that needs to get done. There's going to be some removal of anything that's ferrous that's causing any staining. Um, adjacent to that window. So, um, I think that's basically the scope. Okay. No, that's all the windows, eight, 18 windows as a whole Yeah, building. yeah. And, and we did, you know, as part of the study, of course, we did our, our site survey and our existing condition drawings and measured up all the windows. So we have a lot of that already documented. And now with the study completed, we know, you know, what the, the configuration of, of the, the, the windows originally were, which is pretty interesting. Now, uh, on the maintenance part, the, you did come for the roof. Did you take care of the roof, or is that something you're we, planning on? No, we are, well, we are, we have repaired it, um, and we are taking that in portions, and we are actually looking at SBE funding <clears throat> that we um, got a little bit of during COVID, you know, we're doing like, every as everyone else is, just trying to uh, make maintain. it through and maintain but you know we are we are looking into getting okay. that done um, so we're we're doing what we what we can we don't have the funds personally to do it um, nor are we <clears throat> you know the building is holding its own okay but um, you know we're just hopeful that we can you know, get some help and we can do what we have to do because we always we always will yeah, yeah. Uh, do we have any questions from the board all righty can I have a motion to move us on to the next round under historic preservation I'll make a motion to move it to the next round for funding under historic preservation category I'll second that <coughs> a roll call Alexander Silva yes Caroline Aubin yes Kristen Cantara Oliveira yes Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Vic Catharius, yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you hungry? We're starving. <laughs> starving. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. Stay well, everybody. We should have snacks for this night. <laughs>
All right. Uh, next one is a Matasoy at uh, number five fire and police station. Hayloft exterior restoration. Uh, $197,300. Uh, Gloria Jacobson and uh, Charlie Family Trust. That's at Stafford Road, uh, AE 11, K26. That's Freedom Street. Freedom Street. Freedom yeah, Street. Freedom Street. Freedom. Oh, okay. I'm just I, reading I up what I got. I saw that in there. I wasn't <laughs> sure where that um, Stafford is. Yeah. It is, it is Freedom Street. <laughs> We decided we're moving the house to <laughs> Stafford Road, so don't worry about it. Oh, there is one on Stafford Road, though, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, there's, yeah, one way down the yeah, dentist's down. office, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're going to move you right next door. Okay. <laughs> so. All right. So... Mike, you want to tell us a little about what they're going to be doing? This is essentially, uh, you know, similar to the last application, um, you know, uh, in terms of what we did last year. This is a resubmission of the application from last year. And um, what we're looking to do is to perform masonry restoration uh, on the Kaloff structure, um, which is the, the side that's really... Um, also in need of, of restoration. Uh, there's some sections of the masonry, especially at the head, below the roof line, which is starting to peel away from the building, and there's some water infiltration that has occurred. Um, and it's led to some damage to the framing, the wood framing of that hayloft. So part of this would be to, um, to you know, restore the structure of the, the hayloft as well. So that's essentially the scope. It's really just that that facade that we're looking for. Okay. Um, all right, that looks all good. Now the work that uh, we funded, uh, I forget what year it was, on the one side, have, how's that come That's along? Is that finished? Elevation. Right. So we, um, normally we don't, our office doesn't get involved in procuring the contractors, but we produce the contract documents, right, the drawings mm -hmm. and the specifications. So, uh, however, in this case we did bring in masons that are um, well experienced with historic masonry. So we had at least three contractors that came in. Um, they all expressed interest in the project. Um, we had a um, sort of a bid due date. Uh, that date came and went and did not receive bids from uh, the contractors that have experience with historic masonry. Um, we extended that bid out even further. Um, both said that they were interested, but didn't, we didn't get the bid in from, from either contractor. So we are having a bit of a challenge trying to get um, a mason that, that we have worked with that, um, or know of at least, that's experienced with historic masonry. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've gotten a few come up, but they're really not knowledgeable about what it is that we're trying to attain so yeah. that we'll stand up longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's specific. It's specific to the building. It has to be, like Mike said, it has to be someone that's really acquainted with what needs to be done to a historic property. So. Yeah, right. So you know the work that that we do, right? I think you know, right? And and, and Vicky, you come out to the job site mm -hmm. too, and uh, um, you know there's there's very specific requirements in the Secretary of Interior standards and how you um, you restore masonry. Okay, how you mm -hmm. repoint masonry. Uh, how you grind out the joints, okay, and remove the mortar. Um, so anybody can say, yes, I can do that. But, you know, we're out there as architects and we police that work to make sure that that's being done correctly. Um, we're out there at least once a week on the job site to inspect it. We have meetings, pre-con meetings, pre-construction meetings before, um, during, you know, and throughout the whole job until completion. So we do everything from requiring the contractors to send out mortar for analysis, not so much for the color, but the composition to make sure that they're testing uh, the original mortar and getting it back to what was originally there. So there's a whole process that's involved. You know, if we're looking at brick replacement, you know, we do mock-ups. We do mock-ups for the cleaning, right? Just like we did 
with uh -huh. the gatehouse uh, North Burial. We have three areas of cleaning and there's mm -hmm. various you know, levels of cleaning. So we photo document all that. I mean, that's our work. But the contractor has to prepare all of these mock-ups for everything, repointing, three different mock-ups. So, so there's a lot of work that's involved. It's not just hiring somebody that is, uh, is just going to come in and just do some repointing and, and be done with it. So we can certainly do that, but that's not what we're yeah. supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, you know, part of it, we spent quite a bit of time talking about it. it's frustrating, especially too, especially when the contractors that we have worked with before. And um, I can go on to attribute to multiple factors, not just, just COVID, but um, it's, it's a very difficult environment out there for, for contractors right now. And it's very difficult to get qualified contractors, not just in the historic masonry, but, uh, but else, elsewhere for other trades. So, um, you know, we talked to, I talked to the masons, and we think of the trade schools that are local, no one's really, you know, there's one trade school out in the Cape that, that is, has, has masonry as a trade. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway. Yeah. So, I think we're just going to keep at it, John. That's all I can say is, okay. is we're going to keep working uh, with the Jacobsons to try to get someone on. And now you're entering into the cold months, right? Winter conditions, it's not really the time for historic masonry to do restoration, right? Because when you get in cold weather conditions, then you start putting admixtures in the mortar, which is okay for new construction. You don't do that for historic masonry. So we sort of missed that time period, I think, in the fall now. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to look toward a, a spring project. Um, and I think maybe in the next few months to start bringing in um, some contractors. And I think maybe ex expanding the network that, that we have and going you know, some further places north, which I know the prices are, are going to be higher, but we do have some that are up, you know, just around the Boston area that we can we can bring in. I'm trying to limit it to, to contractors, not necessarily Fall River, but New Bedford and um, some in Rhode Island, too, that are very good. So, anyway, sorry for the long answer. But All right. It's Any a other? frustrating process, let me tell you. So, <laughs> well, we've owned the building since 1990. We bought it from the city, or they kind of gave it to us. No, no, not really. But, uh, so we've had been ongoing with different procedures of restoration of it. Through the years, I have four apartments in it. There's room for a couple more. I choose. I'm too old to bother. Not to bother. I'm just too old to to follow through with that. I have a son and a son-in-law that are eager to present continue. or to continue yeah, on yeah. with, they're following with all the procedures we're going through now, so they will be well aware of it. Mm -hmm. But it's a beautiful building. We've yeah. loved it, it from the beginning. Yeah, definitely is. Mm -hmm. Because of the last award, there was a requirement for deed restrictions to be placed on this property. Okay. And I do know that uh, the deed restrictions for your property have not been done yet. Um, in fact, I may be um, changing the attorney who was originally assigned. So there's, um, but eventually there's going to be two deed restrictions, one in the historic preservation category and one in the community housing category. Okay. You're in agreement with that, correct? Yes. Yeah. And I don't remember, but the last time you were approved in both categories, historic preservation and community housing. There, were there two units that are... Yeah, I don't recall. I don't recall the, that either. I'd, I'd have to go back and look. Um, I don't, don't remember. Two what units that? that are finished the sentence. Um, come within the... Um, Affordable. Eligible affordability guidelines. Oh, yeah, yeah. How much money yeah. that you can charge for rent yeah. yes. as far as the guidelines of the city? Yeah. Yes, and they were. Yeah, affordable housing. I think yeah. you. I think yours was two units, yeah. correct? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay, we can check the records, but okay. if that's the case, and the reason why I mention that, if that is the case, then 
this project would again qualify in both the historic preservation and community housing category. Okay. Um, so I would, I would make, and I would say that there's no other community housing application, so maybe that is of assistance. So I would make a motion that, um, but you understand that limits how much money you can charge for rent for I believe the two units, okay? Oh, I, I know we're below the average anyway for okay. what we charge for oh. rent, yeah. All right, okay. so I would make a motion that this <coughs> application qualifies in both the historic preservation and the community housing categories. I'll second the motion. Second, uh, roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliveira, yes. Paul Machado, yes. John Brandt, yes. Victor Farris, yes. All righty. Thank you. Okay. Thank your, you. Your evening has been unanimous in yeses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You did a good job, all of you. That was a car show uh, Sunday. I'm like, I just want to show you that, so I wrote some letters to John. Charlie, how was the car show on Sunday? Oh, okay. Nice. Fair. Oh, okay. When I find the time to get to it, oh, or it's raining or something like that. Well, I bumped into your daughter. She was on the way down to see you. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That was nice. Yeah, she's a big... Yeah. She's getting used to, or she is involved in this. Oh. Because we, we couldn't do it, but she has the electronic devices like email, or, yeah. or even more than that, whatever. I don't know nothing. She makes coffee. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. We'll I said we didn't, we didn't do new business. business. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm hungry too, Paul. <laughs> to, um, for an extension. Okay. Because we didn't. Already. And then I, I gave you a copy of this too, which is. What time is it? Eight o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is the I thought it was later. Oh. So. All right. You don't. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> the seven eleven. Oh, nice. All righty. Uh, let's see. Uh, New business? Good night, everyone. Good night. I think uh, under new uh, new business for next time, if we could add, we might want to do the Pledge of Allegiance since we have a flag yes. behind us. Oh. Okay. Sure. Uh, so, it's up uh, to you guys if you want to do it. Nah, that's, that's pretty good. Do we need to make a motion on that and vote on that? I don't think that's... I think it's no. good for you to add it to the agenda. Yeah, yeah, I don't think we need to vote on that. Okay, so can I have a motion to adjourn? Um, can I just oh, make sure. a comment about new business? Sure. Um, so we did um, present the application for the funds to uh, record the deed restrictions, and that was approved at the last city council meeting. So those are for the prior year's deed restrictions. So that's going to set up an account with the registry so that we can now record the deed restrictions. Good. So that'll bring us up to date with all deeds. No. <laughs> no. no. Oh. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, anything else? Okay. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I will make a motion to adjourn. Second that. Second. Roll call vote. Alexander Silva, yes. Caroline Aubin, yes. Kristen Cantara Oliveira, yes. Paul Machado, yeah. <laughs> Don't John worry. Brent, yes. Mr. <laughs> Victor Ferris, yes. All righty. Thank you, folks. Good night. Uh.